it's currently rainstorming in Orange County. It is gloomy. The wind is loud. <laughs> These are my October reads. I should have a cocktail, but it's coffee. It should be a cocktail because <laughs> at long last, I think this may be my long awaited, my most, what I've been looking forward to the most <laughs> all year because it's Ina's, first of all, it's Ina and it's her pandemic baby. You know how I feel about pandemic babies. And in go to dinners, she talks about her experience during lockdown. Obviously, she's keeping this very lighthearted, but just how she, in general, how her perceptions of what dinner food is has shifted during lockdown when, if you can recall, in the great distance that is known as 2020, the days when there's no such thing as popping to the store just for one or two missing ingredients. Remember those days? <laughs> So go to dinners is basically her take on what dinner really is. And it starts off with this gorgeous, gorgeous call to arms, call to dinner. <laughs> I love you. Come for dinner. Isn't that the invitation we all want to hear? It promises an evening of good food, warm conversations, and the chance to share our lives with family and close friends. But to me, come for dinner is more than just an invitation to a meal. It's a celebration of community. Dinner nourishes our bodies, but it's the connection with people we love that nourishes our souls. And that's what I actually crave the most. I love how she opens her book with that paragraph, getting that bullseye of what we were all missing during lockdown. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that most of us on booktube are severe introverts. And a lot of us probably weren't suffering that much, having to stay at home, not having to go out into society. Nevertheless, we still all probably missed that connection that we made imperceptibly, unknowingly, unconsciously, where we just had people over to chat and have drinks with at the end of the day, at the end of the week, catching up with each other's lives. Like we can only self-soothe with alcohol alone on a weekly, daily basis. I think we as a society have quickly realized over the past two years that we need each other. And it's in these tones that Ina is gifting us her Bob Rossness letting us know that it's okay, making us feel at home, comfortable, warm, safe. It's gonna be okay. The food, the food is really simple. It is not beneath her to write a recipe for white rice, for brewing coffee, for whipped cream. I don't ding her for it. Like her shtick is all about keeping the basics pristine. Nobody is too stupid to learn the basics. She is here for you. And you know, a lot of it is breakfast food. Why can't we have breakfast for dinner? I have been a long, long champion of such, of such a notion. But yeah, she raises those kinds of questions, not that deeply. You know, we're keeping it really light here. She's raising questions of what is determined as good. What is, what is good? What is normal? And basically the answer is whatever you want. <laughs> whatever makes you feel good, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you like, whatever you think is a good idea. I love this line that she wrote. If I don't look forward to dinner, I'm just not happy all day. Simple, but wow. <laughs> Very true. It's, it's the little things. This is an odd one, but I wanted to include it in my October reads. I read with my son every day. And it's been great dipping into children's books, children's classics. He is in first grade, so we're looking at that reading level. And I fondly recall to this day the gorgeous, the adorable Baybar the King by Jean de Brunhoff. Got it from the library. The watercolor illustrations are just as beautiful and charming as I recall, especially of Queen Celeste cooking in her apron. But what the hell kind of colonialism, capitalism, hegemony is this? Did I say that right? Oh God. 
They build upon the fab, lush nature, and then the illustrations become these orderly rows of houses and bland boxes for city buildings. Everyone has jobs, but woohoo, don't worry, you get to play on weekends. And the ruling class is most generous. You are so lucky and you're very much welcome for this reversal of lifestyle. I, I was a little shocked. <laughs> I don't recall the story being like this at all, but I guess this is part of the whole post-2020 woke paradigm shift we're all going through where we're revisiting our old beloved favorites and realizing that they're not that great. They don't hold up. Also, how is, how is this a children's book? Like, kids can't read this. What, these words? Some of these words don't even exist anymore. My son did like saying the term amusement park though. Drawing still great, story not so much. This month, the vast majority of my reading came from the library. Three Rooms by Joe Hamia. I read via ebook. This is about income inequality of millennial rage of our current post-capitalist society. I learned a new phrase from this book. It's either BAME or B-A-M-E. I think it's a British term that stands for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. But in the US, we, we say the term POC. I highlighted a lot. It seemed to me that even the highest echelons of power existed by virtue of their quarters would be loath to give them up. Perhaps what the rampant racism, anti-immigration policy, and classism came down to was an arbitrarily powerful group of people wanting to preserve a world which could birth them into secure rooms, give them dorms in Eton and Oxford, chambers in Westminster, then a pension and country house to retire in. Now, even to me, it seemed ridiculous to conceive that I had accumulated substantial debt and a few degrees so that I might contractually labor for the sake of having two free days a week in which to cook a meal in a kitchen I could not actually afford to own for a small crowd of people my age who spent their lives doing the same. That's, that's what this book is about. It's great. I really enjoyed it. Virginia Woolf gets cited a lot, specifically in the way that I personally think of Miss Wolf. So that's satisfying. But overall, I just, it was a frustrating reading experience because for this argument, I personally just can't get past the thought, the feelings of why the hell is it so hard to pay people for their work? Why is that such an outrageous idea? I don't understand. What doesn't help, there's also a slight sense of remove of coldness, this like, I'm tired of this intolerant tone. There's no warmth. Johamia is obviously a very smart person, a very smart writer, but the key message of this novel is addressing that sad girl trope, questioning it, like, why are we so sad? Because we're poor, <laughs> like we're poor, we're depressed, we're sad. And like, yeah, I agree, justified, but it never really gets past that. I did enjoy the time, spent wallowing in it and i greatly appreciate the virginia wolf slam statesmen architects pioneers of women's suffrage prime ministers authors artists had all lived here and because of this the price of rent in the area meant i never would instead of feeling free to ramble i felt dread the tube was too expensive i gave up street haunting so i really enjoyed this book i'm surprised that i didn't purchase it maybe i will in future because that cover is gorgeous. Yeah, if that's if this is your thing, I highly recommend it. If not, stay the fuck away from this. <laughs> We're getting into the depths. We're wallowing in it. <laughs> so of course, we're reading A Room of One's Own, finally. I'll get right to the point. I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to see why smarty pants people like Virginia Woolf so much. Apparently I bought this book from Folio. There is some lovely writing in here, the essential oil of truth, but again, very similar to Three Rooms. There's something so inherently frustrating about the core message of women just needing some money, <laughs> some space of their own to be able to be a person for some goddamn autonomy. Duh, why is that so hard? Why is this so infuriatingly hard to make happen? I found it 
tickling uh, reading this where she talks about a lot of things that my friends and I already talk about on the daily. Basically railing against the patriarchy, pondering how the hell do men, some dumb men, live throughout the day, like get up in the morning, dress themselves, feed themselves, earn their living, <laughs> when they're so obviously inept at everything. So very clearly, I see her influence, how she walked so that we can run, but I'm still sticking to my initial reaction, my initial opinion of her, in that her, her entitlement is rooted in her whiteness. Like she, she herself is next to the privileged white man and she's just looking at him going, well, why can't I have that? That's like, I smell that stink of that white woman privileged feminism. But you know, there's tons of pretty writing in this. No need to hurry, no need to sparkle, no need to be anybody but oneself. One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. Drink, so that we may repair some of the damages of the day's living. There is no gate, no lock, no bolt that you can set upon the freedom of my mind. If I read this and Virginia Woolf in general pre-2020, I can, I can easily see this being a brain bomb for me, but alas, I'm merely discovering Virginia Woolf in 2022, and I can't unsee her very smart questions raised exactly only because she has the money and the space to do so. I basically like, it's very, it's very short, but I was like constantly reading through this to look for clues to anything disproving my opinions to no avail. These next three books are, these next three books, these next three books I borrowed from the library and just loved so much that I had to buy them and own them. The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, Stories by Mariana Enriquez. I read the first two short stories of, and then my library hold was about to expire and I couldn't renew it, but I was already sold. Like, yes, I'm, I'm buying it. <laughs> I have to own this. And then I finished it and reading experience was just okay. It wasn't like, it's not gonna be in my top 10 of the year by any means, but I don't regret owning this at all. I do have several other short story collections that are very similar to this and I feel like it belongs with them, like it belongs in my bookshelf. This is very spooky, very haunting, very beautiful, very cruel. Each one is like a horror story, but the horrors are rooted in reality. Yes, there's lots of ghosts, but like, what are ghosts? really. What are ghosts other than the horrors of our lives that continue and remain to haunt us? This was a great spooky season read, but make it POC real. Nothing is more scary than being vulnerable. White on White by Aishigal Savas. Another library physical copy I was reading and immediately knew I had to own this like this. This is definitely going to be in my top 10 for the year. I need this. <laughs> like, ostensibly, I bought this to highlight in it, but I didn't highlight anything because I feel like if I did, I'd just highlight the whole book. And I really wanted to re have this remain, like, pure and pristine for future rereads. This is, like, an even more ephemeral Elena Ferrante. It might seem like an abstract discipline, but it was actually very concrete. Just as she wouldn't think of eating a piece of food that was rotten, she did not want to allow tainted thoughts to take up space inside her. This book is about somebody older warning somebody younger of what's about to happen to that young person. <laughs> okay, I'm only 36, but I already felt like the older person. <laughs> Just of all the things that nobody told you about life, that is so much. And I feel like if you knew when you were younger, it would have helped. The story is basically about an older woman temporarily living with a younger woman in an academic setting. There's art involved and via anecdotes and personal stories, the older woman shares with the younger woman about her life and therefore life in general. And if, oh, that is the kind of book that I eat, that I devour, that I make a feast of. And it's so short. I could have read tenfold of this. I, I highly recommend all of the Smarty Pants booktubers are 
reading and fawning over this. I I see why. It's so good. Complete with the tragic arc of the older woman starting off being revered and looked up to by the younger woman. But by the end, the younger woman sees the older woman as insecure, borderline annoying, whom she tries to avoid, is afraid of. If that is not a classic mother and daughter relationship, if that is not a classic human relationship, a relationship with ourselves, we form ourselves through our doubles. We make ghostly twins to carry the weight of our desires. And then we also read My Name is Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout, which is the first book that precedes O William that I read last month. Yeah, her. Pro I stand by my statement in my last video saying that Elizabeth Strout is like an Anglo-Saxon Elena Ferrante. Her prose just washes over me. I'm bathed in womanly senses. Her prose is just glorious. Lonely was the first flavor I had tasted in my life and it was always there hidden inside the crevices of my mouth, reminding me. She was as beautiful as her face, I thought, and I loved New York for this gift of endless encounters. The sound of growing corn and the sound of my heart breaking. The plot of this book isn't at all what's important, because as I said, everything just washes over you. There's a key relationship with Lucy and another writer named Sarah Payne, that's electrifying. I want to be such a woman. She teaches Lucy and us about writing, but really about living. Go to the page without judgment. You'll only have one story. You'll write your story many ways. Don't ever worry about story. You have only one. Yeah, Elizabeth Strout has become a, like a last minute dark horse of the year. I love her. And last but not least, I pre-ordered Which Side Are You On by Ryan Lee Wong. I've been trying to make a habit of pre-ordering from debut Korean or Korean American writers. And this cover, if this doesn't say LA, nothing does. <laughs> it's gorgeous. So this is a very fast read. It's fun. We have an almost comically insufferable protagonist where every single response retort he makes has to be the most SJW statement he could possibly utter, but like every detail is correct. <laughs> All the woke ideology, the terminology, the details of LA Korean food versus New York Korean food, LA kids versus Orange County kids. I know this person. <laughs> I know this whiny, self-righteous man who's lucky and privileged to have badass women in his life, such as his mom and his BFF, CJ, who loves Ulysses so much, it makes me want to read the classic James Joyce book that I didn't think that I would ever touch in my life, to be honest, because I didn't think that I would get it. But maybe I will. <laughs> yeah, this is so fun. It was funny. It was as if someone had designed a special hell for me, a darkened furnace pumped with mass market hip hop and filled with preening Hollywooders. That was why people did yoga, exertion to simulate actual work without any of the self-examination of, say, understanding white supremacy. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. I had a good time reading it. I also thought of Korean American by Eric Kim, because it's basically saying the same thing, just in Eric Kim's cookbook, it's said in a more warm, more caring voice with loving, gentle, caring hands. I had a lot of fun reading this, but immediately after I did paint my nails and watch a lot of Sex and the City episodes to counterbalance. <laughs> so that was what I read in October, along with a lot of Agatha Christie's, which I still need to make my damn Agatha Christie video on. Lots to say in that one, but overall I had a really good reading month. It was fun, despite a lot of socioeconomic wallowing topics. But I do enjoy that, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the year. What should I say? I'm currently in the middle of Sirens and Muses, which is another fun one. I'm, I started Disorientation, but I just never went back to it. I still need to finish my War and Peace vlogs. <sighs> yeah, a lot more videos that I want to crank out in the next two months. Send strength. I hope you all had a very great October reading life, life in general, socioeconomic statuses, <laughs> and I'll see you next time.
Bye.